As a diabetes specialty PA, part of my job is to know what type of diabetes my patients have. That's the only way that I can guarantee that they're getting the right treatment. The vast majority of people with diabetes have type 2, about 85 to 90% of them. Type 1 diabetics make up another 8 to 10%. And with a little bit of training and some clinical experience, it's not that challenging, it's not that hard to figure out what type of diabetes a person has. There's clues that we can gather from a person's health history, the age at which they were diagnosed can be helpful, and there's even blood tests that we can use to help make the determination. But what happens when somebody doesn't quite fit into one group or another. On today's Sugar High video, we're talking about a rare and often underdiagnosed form of diabetes called Modi. Welcome to Sugar High Guys, I'm PA David, a board certified and licensed diabetes specialty PA practicing in Southern California and Sugar High is a channel where you can come for relatable and reliable diabetes information that's always easy to understand. MODI stands for Maturity Onset Diabetes of the Young, and it accounts for about 1-2% to of all cases of diabetes. Now only 1-2% to is a pretty small number, and it may not seem significant enough to really worry about. Certainly not a big enough deal to warrant its own YouTube video, right? Until you actually look at the numbers. When you consider the fact that over 450 million people in the world have diabetes, 2% of that is 9 million people. What's really mind-blowing about this is that over 80% of people with Modi never get properly diagnosed. So imagine if the entire population of New York City had a disease and four out of five of them had no idea and hardly anybody, even in the medical community, was talking about it. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes both have a genetic component in terms of what causes them and there's numerous different genes involved in the development of both type 1 and type 2. But there's a lot of environmental factors that come into play as well, like autoimmune processes or a triggering infection in type 1, or weight and diet issues in type 2. But Modi is straight up genetic. You inherit a gene from one of your parents, and that's it. For every protein or hormone that your body makes, you have a gene that allows you to make that hormone. Since the action of insulin and blood sugar management in general is really a complex process, there's many different proteins and receptors involved in how the whole insulin system works. And that means that there's just as many genes that have to be intact for it to all fit together. In Modi, one of those genes has a mutation that keeps it from properly making the protein that it codes for. And that breaks part of the chain in either insulin production or the action of insulin, and diabetes is the result. Since only one single gene defect is the cause of the diabetes in Modi, we refer to it as monogenic diabetes. That word monogenic means pertaining to one gene. But remember how we said that there's all sorts of genes involved in making insulin and allowing it to work? Modi can happen in any one of those genes. So there's actually many different types of Modi, and each type is characterized by the specific gene that's responsible. There are at least 14 different types of Modi that we know about so far, but only four of them are particularly common. The other 10 combined make up only 1% of all Modi cases. Finding out what type of Modi a patient has is important because knowing which gene is affected lets us know what treatment is going to help that person the best. Now since these gene defects result in flawed insulin production, you'd probably think that a person with Modi is guaranteed to need insulin, kind of like a person with type 1, right? Well, you might be surprised. While people with certain types of Modi absolutely need insulin, other Modi types do just fine with oral medications. And there's even one type of Modi that doesn't need any treatment at all. So how do you know if you have Modi? Well, the first clue that can make us suspect Modi is if there's a strong family history of diabetes. Remember, this is genetic. Someone with Modi diabetes has a mom or a dad with diabetes, whether mom or dad has been diagnosed or not. And if it's Modi, any brothers or sisters have a 50% chance of also having it. So if there's a bunch of first-degree relatives with diabetes, Modi might be a possibility. 
Another strong clue is when a person doesn't have the typical features that we'd expect in type 1 or type 2. Let me give you some examples. Type 1 can happen at any age, right? That's why we don't call it childhood diabetes anymore. But it is absolutely true that it most commonly starts in childhood or young adulthood. There's commonly this rapid decline in glucose control after the disease starts, and there's measurable antibodies that we can test for that the immune system is producing against the insulin-producing cells in the pancreas. And without any treatment or insulin replacement, type 1 often declines into diabetic ketoacidosis, which can be a life-threatening condition. Somebody who's thin and diagnosed before the age of 25 or 30 is normally going to be suspected of being type 1, right? But if there's no antibodies against the beta cells and the person isn't going into ketoacidosis without treatment, hmm. Type 2 diabetes most commonly happens in older adults, and there are frequently other contributing factors like obesity. Even if under the age of 30, if a person is overweight and the severity of the diabetes is only mild to moderate, it's commonly assumed that they have type 2 diabetes and they're started on the typical medications. But in about 1 out of 20 people diagnosed with type 2 diabetes before the age of 45, it was actually a Modi patient that got missed. So that's what might make us suspect Modi, but how do we know for sure? Well, we're in luck. We have very simple genetic blood tests that your doctor can order at most outpatient labs that test for the four or five most common types of Modi all in one panel. And if we healthcare providers just think to order the test, we can rule it in or out just like that. Now, I'm not going to bore you with talking about the exact gene names or what the specific role of each gene is with each type of Modi, but I'll put them on the screen as we talk about them just so you have them if you want them and for the sake of being complete. But what we should talk about is how each type is treated because the whole point of figuring out what type you are is so that we know what to do about it. I'm going to go through these in order of what's most common rather than just going one, two, three. They get numbered in the order that they're discovered, but that doesn't mean that the first to be discovered is necessarily the most common. Modi 3 is the most common form of Modi, particularly amongst people of European descent. The majority of people with Modi 3 develop diabetes before the age of 25. And for those who develop diabetes after 25, it is almost never any later than age 35. And you can see how this would make it really easy to misdiagnose as type 1, right? People with Modi 3 have a slow, gradual, and progressive dysfunction in the beta cells in the pancreas. The beta cells aren't getting destroyed by the immune system like in type 1, but they lose the ability to secrete insulin properly. And because of the gradual weakening of those beta cells, people with Modi 3 usually end up needing insulin. But earlier on, Oral medications called sulfonylureas usually work really well to control their blood sugar and put off the need to start insulin for several decades. So while yeah, they're gonna eventually need insulin, if you can get away with a pill for the next 20 years instead, why not, right? Like type 1 and type 2 diabetes, Modi 3 comes with a high risk of complications like chronic kidney disease, retinal disease, and cardiovascular disease. But identifying it and getting it properly treated and controlled early can reduce the chances of those complications. Now, it's most commonly misdiagnosed as type 1, but if the person is heavy, it can easily be misdiagnosed as type 2 as well. But something that separates it from the typical appearance of type 2 diabetes, though, is that their HDL, or the good cholesterol, can be high. People with type 2 diabetes commonly have a low HDL and high triglycerides, so that high HDL level can sometimes trigger us to think outside of that type 2 box. Modi 2 is the second most common form. This is caused by a totally different gene and has a totally different appearance. People with Modi 2 usually get diagnosed by accident because it causes this very slow and mild increase in blood glucose that usually doesn't have any symptoms. We usually find these folks with blood work that's done during like a routine checkup and we notice that the sugar level is a bit elevated or maybe the A1C is just a little high, like 6.7%. A glucose tolerance test during pregnancy is another way that this can get caught. The cool thing about Modi 2 is that the blood glucose elevation never really gets any worse than this and they don't usually develop any of the problems or complications of diabetes that we see with type 1 and type 2. And that means that these people don't require any treatment. No medications, no insulin. 
And this is a great example about why it's so important that these people get diagnosed. When someone in their 30s or 40s is found to have a hemoglobin A1C level of like 6.8 or 6.9, the primary care doctor is usually gonna make the assumption that they have type two diabetes and they're gonna give them something like metformin. But if what they actually have is MOD2, they don't need it. That's a misdiagnosis and the patient is taking a medication that they don't need. MOD1 is the third most common. This makes up only about 10% of all cases. MOD1 is on a different gene than MOD3, but the symptoms and appearances are similar. Although this one's a little easier to misdiagnose as type 2 diabetes because like type 2, the HDL or good cholesterol tends to be lower. You might remember that the HDL was often higher in people with MOD3. MOD1 can be treated for years with oral medications like sulfonylureas, but as time goes by, the beta cells in the pancreas eventually weaken and insulin becomes necessary. The last type that we're going to cover in this video is MOD5. We can skip number four because it's incredibly rare. MOD5 makes up about 5% of all cases and it's a bit more rough than the others. The diabetes can start anywhere from infancy through middle adulthood and the symptoms and manifestations can be really variable. Some people don't need treatment until adulthood, but others have a more severe form with this poorly developed pancreas and kidneys. People with MOD5 can develop cystic kidney disease and the gradual loss of kidney function, even without what we normally think of as typical diabetic kidney disease, also known as nephropathy. But because of that wasting away of the pancreas, patients with MOD5 usually require insulin. So there's your introduction to MOD. I honestly hope that this will be helpful to somebody because even though it's only one to 2% of diabetics, if 100 people with diabetes see this, Statistically speaking, one or two of them should be thinking, hmm, that kind of sounds like my situation. And if that's you, it might be worth having a conversation with your healthcare provider to see if a simple genetic blood test might offer you some insight into customizing your diabetes management. By the way, the story of rare forms of diabetes outside of type 1 and type 2 does not end here with Modi. Keep an eye on Sugar High and make sure that you subscribe because now that you've met Modi, I would love to introduce you to Lada. I'll see you in the next video.